I'm Jared Blue with Juicy.com. We're here with Peter Beinart. Peter is the author of The Icarus Syndrome, also a columnist for Daily Beast, and a professor here at the City University of New York School of Journalism. Peter, thank you. Thank you. So uh, in June of this past year, you wrote a piece for the New York Review mm -hmm. of Books, um, got a lot of attention, particularly in the Jewish community, about um, how the sort of debate over Israel plays out in the United States. Mm -hmm. So. I guess for our audience, if you could just explain what your kind of central thesis was and why you felt the need to write this. So my argument was that there's a contradiction at the heart of the organized American Jewish community's support for Israel. If you look at the way the organized American Jewish community justifies its support for Israel, um, groups like APAC and the President's Conference, the ADL, don't say, we should support Israel because Israel's a Jewish state and we're Jews, period. They say, we should support Israel because we believe in democracy as American Jews, that's those are the ideals mm -hmm. we believe in, and that's why we support Israel, because Israel is a liberal democratic state, it allows free expression, human rights. Um, but uh, they never really grapple with the fact that if you're actually committed to Israeli liberal democracy, uh, you might actually need to be in conflict with the policies of the Israeli government, which I think are actually a pretty serious threat to Israeli liberal democracy, particularly the occupation of the West Bank. Right, so uh, just to follow up on that quickly, yeah. so. Is it possible that organizations like APAC, do you think that they're, that they have a political position that they support in Israel, or is it just whoever is in power in Israel, they support them reflexively, almost like a press secretary? Um, there's been a debate about this question. Um, uh, the, the stated position is that they support whoever is in power in Israel, and they say Israel is a democracy, and that they have the right to elect their leaders, and we want. In reality, um, there were a lot of accusations by uh, in the 90s uh, under the Rabin government, from Rabin himself and from Yossi Balin, who was deputy prime minister, that in fact the APAC was distinctly lukewarm towards Israeli governments that were pushing a peace process and much more comfortable with Israeli governments. And not only APAC, but also the President's Conference. There was a lot of writing about this. In fact, that's a big part of the reason that the Israel Policy Forum was created because of the sense that APAC was not actually supportive of the peace process. So I think there's that actual, there's, there's a genuine question about that. But I think even if it were true that the, Isra that the that APAC and the President's Conference simply supported whichever government happened to be in power, um, in the, I think that itself would not be, in my, in my view, a morally justifiable position. Okay, and one of the things you talk about, um, just you think about for people who read Juicy.com, mm -hmm. right, it's a lot of young Jews who struggle with this issue yeah. all the time. You know, you brought up this idea of liberal Zionism. Yeah. How would you define what that is and why you think it's incongruous with, with what the messages that young Jews get? Um, so, uh, liberal Zionism is uh, the idea that Israel, the Zionist project was not only about creating, or it was not only about a return to Jewish sovereignty, it was about uh, incarnating in Jewish sovereignty a certain set of values. Uh, and in many ways, those were the values that the the 19th century Zionists like Herzl, and Le Pin Leon Pinsker, and Moses Hess, and Chad Chaim, believed that Europe had betrayed. Mm -hmm. I mean, those people all wanted the European states to be liberal states that, that provided true, full equality regardless of race, religion, and sex. And that's why the, that very language is in Israel's Declaration of Independence, because they, they eventually gave up on the idea that Europe would extend those rights to Jews. But their image of where Europe had failed was critical to their idea of what Israel should be as a country. Uh, and it seems to me that that's why I believe that there is a liberal core within Zionists. Not all Zionist thinkers, certainly not all people who call themselves Zionists, but if you read Herzl's writings, if you read the Israeli Declaration of Independence, it's really baked in there. Um, but it seems to me it's threatened. Um, uh, it's threatened by people for, who, who don't actually, um, who don't revere that, that spirit in Israel's Declaration of Independence. There is a tension between a Jewish state and a state whose Declaration of Independence promises full equality of social and political rights. But I think the, the, the critical thing is to try to make Israel a state that goes as far as possible in providing full human rights to its non-Jewish citizens, uh, and certainly does not control 2.5 million people who are not citizens at all. And I think what's happening in many ways is in fact it's going in exactly the wrong direction. Right. I, I think, you know, to play devil's advocate, yeah. you can understand how some people look at this and say, the deck is so far stacked against Israel, mm -hmm. right, whether it's the international media, the international yeah. community, that you almost have to be reflexively uh, hyper-defensive in yeah. a way, right? This tension between them do have, protecting their right to exist 
and us protecting their right to do whatever they want to think that, you know, in order to protect themselves. So, how it seems like that's sort of where a lot of this is coming from, right? It's, I think a lot, yeah, I think, oh, you're right, a lot of that is coming from, but I think um, it's a very self-defeating tendency. Um, there are people out there who um, will always hate Israel, maybe they hate Jews too, um, but I think there's a larger group of people um, who um, are deeply upset at Israel's policies. Um, and if you want to fight the delegitimization of Israel uh, without confronting those policies themselves, I think you're going to fail. Um, the, at the root of the delegitimization of Israel are policies, not for all delegitimizers, but for the, the best thing you could do would be to separate that hardcore of Israel haters from, the, I think, the larger group of people who, who find it impossible to justify in this age what is essentially a colonial occupation in the West Bank. And if you can start to change those policies, I think you can defang some of that delegitimization. You know, for me, an, in, the analogy that I think about sometimes is the civil rights in the United States. In the 1950s, um, the Soviet Union, which, uh, which uh, wanted the destruction of the United States, was constantly using racism and segregation against blacks as a vehicle to, against which to beat the United States. Um, and yet, we didn't say, or at least it wouldn't have made a lot of sense to say, that those people who loved the United States and wanted to make America live up to its ideals in the civil rights movement should have not, uh, not, not criticized America's segregation policy because they didn't want to give aid and comfort to the Soviets who were doing the criticism. And so for me, I don't... I have, I have a view about Israel and a sense of what Israel should be that is rooted in my own experience and my own beliefs, and it seems to me um, I want to follow that, and I think American Jews should follow that, and not take their moral compass from what other people do. Right. So imagine, imagine if you will, mm -hmm. you're a young Jew. Mm -hmm. I, I was once. I, I was once. I, I still know a few. <laughs> or a young Jew, rather, who's at least wrestling with this mm -hmm. issue, right? You get... It seems like you're hearing, you have organizations like APAC yeah. that are on college campuses, yeah. trying to make an impact. If what is there anything on the other side, or is it either you embrace sort of APAC's view of this and those types of organizations, or you kind of become disconnected from it? Well, I think that there are some. You know, there's J Street, which is kind of right. creating an effort to be that. I mean, um, uh, a, a place that that allows people to be. Um, uh, you know, support Israel, uh, but but oppose Israel's policies. Um, I think, I mean, the best advice I would give to anybody who's wrestling with these questions is to go. Um, by which I mean, not just go to Israel, but go to the West Bank as well. You probably can't get into Gaza. But it seems to me the people who I think are most compelling when they talk about this, um, and I don't get, I mean, you can come up, where, come out wherever you want, although I will say, you do not meet a lot of young American Jews or old American Jews who spent any significant time living amongst Palestinians in the West Bank uh, who are not deeply disturbed by the experience. If you, uh, but um, but I, think if, 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 I think if you go and you see all of Israel, because for better or for worse, I think for worse, the West Bank is part of Israel. It's been part of Israel for 43 years now. Um, it's not been annexed except for East Jerusalem, but it's under Israeli sovereignty. So go and see everything in Israel. Um, and then and then and then come back and I think you'll have a, a deeper appreciation and I think then you can sift through the kind of competing messages you get from American Jewish organizations. Seems like a really good commercial for Israeli tourism. Come to Israel and sift through all the difficult issues. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, but that's what it means to really engage with a society. Right. And I think to yeah. really love a society is not just to have some disney vision of it, but actually to, to, to see the, the hard things and to see that there's a struggle going on. I think that, for me, I think that would be a better way of connecting young Jews to Israel than taking them to Israel and essentially never really taking them to, to confront any of the difficulties. Hmm. All right, so last thing I want to talk about yeah. with you, I sure. uh, really appreciate the, your time, though, is um, you wrote a piece on Daily Beast mm -hmm. um, right after Jon Stewart's mm -hmm. Rally to Restore Sanity. Mm -hmm. Um, and you were kind of one of the first people mm -hmm. that I read, mm -hmm. along with Bill Maher, who yeah. were actually had the courage to be mm -hmm. critical of Jon Stewart. Which I don't know if it's that much courage. Which but, is a little bit, mm -hmm. well, it's a dangerous thing. Yeah. So it happened to uh, Rick Sanchez. <laughs> <laughs> and so your argument was there were maybe three, there were probably three areas mm -hmm. where he sort of missed the mark. Mm -hmm. um, what were those? First of all, I think um, it's dishonest for Jon Stewart to say 
that he's equally upset about the rancor coming from the ref, left and rancor coming from the right. I mean, come on. John Stewart thinks that the Republicans are idiots, and some of them are bigots, and um, and uh, and that, and he wants to smack them down. And, you know, good for him. I think he does a great job of smacking them down. But I think that it's kind of transparent for him to say that what he really wants is civility. No. What he really wants is basically for everyone to do what he does on a show, which is expose the the kind of lunatic stupidity of a lot of what the conservatives say. I also think that the the other problem, though, is that I think um, uh, the conservative, and I was trying to say in the piece, I think the conservative critique of Obama uh, is much more deeply rooted than people recognize, you know? But, and I think that there's this, it's a long-standing tradition amongst liberals, certainly goes back to the 50s, to basically intellectually condescend to conservatives, to assume that they're basically all stupid. Uh, and, um, in fact, what's striking about conservatives certainly since like the 70s, is they've taken ideas much more seriously than liberals, they put a lot of money into intellectual, into think tanks, and they have a very deeply rooted, uh, coherent idea, which is essentially that the larger the state grows, the more the individual loses his or her freedom. It's an idea with very deep roots. It's not the only idea in American history, but it's one strand in American political thinking. It's a very simple and, and powerful idea. And unless you take it seriously and think about your response, how could you argue? Because freedom, I think, is the basic, essential political language of American politics. You have to justify things in terms of freedom. So how do you argue that actually a larger, more interventionist state can actually make people more free and not less free. And I think that's actually the kind of thing that liberals have not really spent very much time thinking about in the obama Glenn Beck era. And I think that it's, I think, unfortunately, part of what Stewart is doing in that rally was allowing people yet again not to have to grapple with this, with this basic intellectual and moral challenge. Mm. I want to just talk for a second about civility, because sure. it seems like civility is sort of code for bipartisanship yeah. in a lot of cases. Yeah. And Maybe it's just me speaking, yeah. but it seems like we finally got this bipartisanship we're talking yeah. about, right, with this tax cut deal, yeah. Yeah. and we got what both sides don't want, right? So we lower taxes and increase spending. Yeah. Is that really what we're talking about? Is that, is that what, we're, what we're aiming for here when we talk about bipartisanship, is both sides giving up? I'm not for bipartisanship, um, and I'm not really necessarily even for civility. I mean, I think... <laughs> a lot of the stupidest things that America has ever done have been done in a bipartisan way. I mean, support for going to Vietnam between, let's say, 1963 and 1967 was extremely bipartisan. And Democrats and Republicans were completely together in that. Um, so, um, I don't think there's anything inherently good about bipartisanship. I also think that, um, to me, what is not, it's not as important to me whether people are civil or not in their arguments. What's important to me is whether people are serious or not. I mean, if, if, you, I mean, if you condemn people in the harshest language, but you're doing it by really actually looking at, taking the, looking at their arguments and going after them, I think that's totally fine. Um, uh, it seems to me what, what's important is that actually there's a debate about things that matter, about the, argue, about the ideas that are in play, not kind of trivial, stupid, little, made-up scandals that don't really matter at all. And it seems to me, if that's going on, then I don't mind if it gets raucous. What, what bothers me is the, is the triviality, not the, lack of, not the lack of civility.